So the first talk will be given by Dr. Adrian Borsa. Adrian is our director of IGPP. So Adrian, take it away. Thank you, Wenyan. Let me share my screen. Um, I hope you all can see this. So the, my job is to just give you the, the broad overview. And uh, what we're looking at here is this beautiful uh, uh, overhead of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And um, if you know where to look, you will see our buildings perched on the hill. This is the Institute of Geophysics and Planetary Physics. Um, our, the intro to IGP, we call it IGPP. So IGPP, the intro to IGPP actually, uh, in this case, starts with something that if you are standing on the balcony of our Monk building and look offshore, you will see, which is incoming waves, in this case, from the west and northwest. So the swell on the ocean coming towards uh, our beach. And then if you look really carefully here, you'll see a lot of surfers taking advantage of the breakers from that swell. So, you know, this, this beautiful physical um, uh, scene is set here. Now, what is really interesting, if you take a look at this scene even more closely, you'll notice that there's a separate set of swell and breakers that are going in an obvious, well, just a very unusual direction, which is perpendicular to the original ones. And, you know, you might ask, well, what actually is going on there? And you can see those from, from IGBP. It turns out that there is a 1947 study on exactly this phenomenon, refraction of ocean waves, a process linking underwater topography to beach erosion. And if you were to open this paper up, you would discover um, that the process that we're seeing here is an underwater canyon just offshore of the Scripps Pier, which you saw in the previous uh, slide, that is focusing waves right along that canyon. And in fact, creating a set of waves that are much larger than the ones that are impinging upon uh, Scripps Pier and our own beach. And it turns out that this is the reason for the infamous Black's Beach swell, which is featured in Surfer Magazine here in 1998, but you see it all the time. It is one of the iconic uh, beach breaks uh, in the world. Well, why am I going through all this? It's because the author of that study and about these waves uh, was one Walter H. Monk and also Melvin Trailer. And Walter Monk here was appointed assistant professor, I, maybe the first one, uh, uh, actually not the first one, but at the Institute of Geophysics, the La Jolla branch in 1947. So this institute was in fact our forebear. And Walter was here, you can see him on the right, um, an oceanographer and geophysicist. His mentor was Harold Sverdrup, who was director at the time. And this is at a time when Scripps was the size of current IGPP, which is you know around 140 people. Uh, and Sverdrup was also an oceanographer, and that's sort of where things started with IGBP. I mean, it said geophysics, but there was a lot of ocean involved. And in fact, in, I guess it's 56 here, uh, Walter Monk spent a year in Cambridge University, or at Cambridge University at Mattingly Rise, which was their Department of Geodesy and Geophysics. So all these things were sort of swirling around. Um, and it turns out that they came together in a really fundamental way sometime in the late 50s um, with an, the, the organization that we are sort of have grown into um, today. And for that, I'm going to give you a little idea of where sort of what is in our DNA, where do we come from? Well, Sverdrup, the, one of the original directors of Scripps, was really big on physics-based models, and he liked data and respected data. Uh, Walter Monk going to Cambridge, um, there it was physics models, physical models backed up by actual mathematics, but there was also an instrument side of things. And, and you'll see this uh, as we, you get these presentations, that instruments are really fundamental to what IGBP is right now. And I cannot remember where the New Jersey Bell Labs uh, connection was, uh, Duncan Agnew's not online, but this was a place that was bringing in very advanced methods for data analysis. When you put all those together, you know you you sort of started with where IGBP is the the roots of IGBP. I would also say that there's a sense of community here that uh, transcends all of this. That you know working together in disparate fields, but maybe in different ways, we can actually uh, communicating with each other. We're just going to lead in our subjects in a different way. So 
Um, I just point out the initial hires that we had, I'm checking the time, lots of theory, um, not just uh, uh, theoretical geophysics, but geomag, seismology. There was a uh, focus on seismology at the time. That was the observational um, frontier. And I, these are these hires in purple. Interestingly, we did have oceanography at the time, two hires here, those are the red ones, and then data analysis. So, um, you know, if we were to put this all together, I think we can very uh, truthfully say that you would, at IGBP, if you were to come here, you have an opportunity to go into the field if you wish, you don't have to, um, both field being ocean and terrestrial realms, collect your own data, Lots of times you'd be using IGPP's own instruments or instruments that you might have even developed yourself. You would process and analyze that data. We also love remote sensing data sets. We, we um, have uh, quite a bit of work there. We use methodologies that you will actually learn here, not just in class, but from your peers and colleagues. You will build models and our modeling has been, you know, our modeling capacity has really uh, increased quite a bit lately. Interpret the data and you will work with different faculty. So to put this in a slightly different perspective, I'm just giving you an idea of what SIO's educational structure looks like. You'll probably see this more than once today. So we have this department of SIO or scripts. There are the three programs, climate atmospheres, geosciences, which is where we are, ocean biosciences. And if you break those down into the actual curricula, you'll see that, um, well, we, we sort of fit into this GP or geophysics realm, but it's more than that. IGBP really spans a huge part of Scripps itself. Yes, we do geophysics, but absolutely we need and do geoscience. There is marine geochemistry uh, involved in different ways because how do you find out the ages of things? Climate science, absolutely, especially on the polar side, physical oceanography, and then applied ocean sciences. There's a lot of acoustics that go on at IGBP as part of its, its history. Um, we also have connections across uh, campus policy connections, engineering, supercomputing. So I'll wrap this with a little bit of retrospective about IGPP itself, the sort of physical buildings. Um, the Monk building was built in 1962. Um, I will point out that any students who, who are here for their first year um, get to live in the what we call the Keller, uh, German for cellar. Um, but it's a really cool uh, office that overlooks the ocean. It's your own place. Right above the Keller is the IGBP uh, classroom. This is an Ansel Adam photos from early on. Uh, our tables are, well, it looks not so unlike this, this view. Very recently, the Monk building was completely renovated. We won awards for it. It is absolutely gorgeous. And we have this just phenomenal view, uh, which none of us ever get tired of, but it does inspire us to look out and look out at the ocean. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that there was a whole separate, more bucolic uh, set of buildings right above Monk. Um, and then I will finish by saying that if you do come twice a year, you get to witness a Stonehenge-esque uh, uh, phenomenon, which is the sun setting right at the very end of the Monk hallway, and it is uh, an event. All right, so that's just the quick start. We have a lot of people uh, to, to talk to you. Um, welcome to IGBB. Thank you, Adrian. That's excellent. Next, we have uh, GP Curriculum Coordinator, Kathy Constable, to give you an introduction of our um, educational program. Unmute. Unmute would be a good start. So hopefully you're all seeing my screen now. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the uh, graduate program in geophysics specifically um, and at Scripps. And uh, just to uh, give you an idea of what this is about, whoops, I guess I need to go and make this bigger. How's that? That seems like it might work better. Does everybody see this full screen? Yes, it's perfect now. Okay, thank you. So uh, that we are a, a department, Scripps Institution of Oceanography is a department of UC San Diego. As Adrian has already alluded to, we have uh, three graduate programs within the department. And if you are applying, you can apply to one or two. Uh, 
The geophysics program sits within geosciences of the earth, oceans, and planets. So that gives you an idea of the things that we do. And I've drawn this as, uh, as Adrian has already mentioned, we overlap with uh, these other programs. And uh, that's part of the reason why it's possible to apply to one or two or to work across these programs in the, in the graduate program. Within the graduate programs, there are eight curricula groups. Um, ultimately, you have to choose one for the purposes of your degree. And it's a good idea to make that choice early on because then you can get settled, find an advisor or a research project and all the rest of it. We have three degree names. Um, there's earth sciences, oceanography or marine biology. And uh, the degrees that we offer are either a master's degree, an MS or a PhD. And uh, these are uh, just kind of the, the basics of what goes on here. So uh, within the GEO program, uh, the director of that program is Professor Jeff Gee, um, who's in the geosciences curricular group and also in the geophysics curricular group. And uh, within the geophysics curricular group, I'm the geophysics curricular group coordinator. I should have uh, said that I am a professor at IGPP and my main interests are in uh, deep earth geophysics and geomagnetism. So just to show you here um, and remind you that we are an oceanographic institution. One of, that reason, one of the things that means is you have the opportunity to do ocean going experiments. And here we're just illustrating the ships that are part of uh, Scripps uh, fleet. There are some common features across our uh, GEO program. Um, when you, if you come here, then you, in your first year, there's a three person guidance committee plus your advisor. Um, at the end of the first year, there's an exam we call the departmental exam. It has a written piece and an oral piece. And we very much encourage people to begin research in year one and identify what they want to do in the way of research and uh, get settled with an advisor who they can, um, uh, they actually like to work with. Um, there's a qualifying exam where at the end that should be completed by the end of year three, and to do that, um, you have to basically produce a thesis proposal and find a PhD committee who are going to form the, uh, they're going to offer you advice along the way. And then they're also ultimately going to be the people who would be the examiners at the end of your thesis defense. And they also are the examiners for your qualifying exam where they say, yeah, this thesis proposal looks good, or maybe you should think about adjusting it in this way and so on. Okay. so. Um, Next, I will say that uh, one of the things that it's a good idea to do if you're thinking of applying is have a look at the Scripps faculty. Um, you can find over 200 faculty profiles from across Scripps at this website. And uh, that's probably a bit overwhelming. And many of these people will not be directly relevant to your interests. Uh, they might be very biological in their emphasis or very much atmospheric and you would be interested in the solid earth. Um, so if that's an overwhelming thing, then there's a uh, much easier approach, and that is to look just at the geophysicists. There are about 20 faculty and researchers in the geophysics curricular group. And then there are another 15 emeriti who have varying degrees of engagement, um, but are actually an excellent resource for your research. So here's a picture of our, the cover of our annual report from 2020. Um, I recommend reading this because it gives you a great overview of what we do in terms of research topics. Um, everybody who, uh, who works within IGPP is asked to submit a one or two page description of what they did last year and why they think it's important. And it's a really great way of getting an overview of the whole program. Um, I want to mention that uh, we are called Scripps Institution of Oceanography, but we are more than just the oceans. Uh, we have a uh, a lot of uh, emphasis in our curriculum on observational techniques and collection of novel data sets. And I just wanted, I've listed here actually a bunch of titles of the people who graduated in the last few years and the titles of their theses. And you'll see that there's a whole range of things in here from ocean bottom pressure measurements to imaging the oceanic crust to uh, looking at shallow slip for tsunami warnings to uh, Southern California tidal trigger structure, seismic structure and triggering of earthquakes to uh, satellite observations 
around Antarctica to all sorts of things, computational tools for estimating and predicting the state of the geodynamo. So um, I think the, the point to carry away here is that there's a, a wide range of choice in here about what you might like to do. And uh, so don't go away thinking that we don't do it just because you haven't heard about it immediately today. So here's a bit about the PhD timeline. Uh, the average time to degree here is 5.7 years. Um, and it kind of looks like this. So there's, here's a very expanded view of year one. Um, before year one, if you want to get an early start on research or field work or classes, you might have the opportunity to negotiate to come in the summer if your advisor has some funding. Uh, in year one, you have to enroll in a minimum of 12 units each quarter. That could either be classes or it could be a research project where you work with your advisor on some research. And it's a good idea to get started on that during year one. Um, a really important thing is to decide on an advisor by the spring quarter of your first year so that you can focus full time on research going forward. Then in June of the year one, there's a written departmental exam and part two, the oral exam is in late summer. So this is kind of year one in here. And uh, it goes all the way through to year seven over there. Uh, after seven years, we don't let people enroll anymore, but they can, of course, still submit their thesis if they choose to. So year two, take the rest of the classes you need, consult with the advisory group and other students, dig into research. Year three, focus on your research, find a thesis committee, write a thesis proposal and do your qualifying exam. And then uh, you're, you're, you're free to do uh, focus on the thing that you love the most, we hope. And uh, most people are graduating, defending their thesis, writing their thesis, defending and graduating before the end of year six. If you go past there, here's the warning, need to finish as soon as possible. Okay. So here's a huge long list of, whoops, of graduate classes in uh, geophysics. Um, I don't want to go through all of these. I just want to highlight that there are some highlighted in orange here that are foundational classes. These are kind of methodology and strategy classes that we uh, think people should take in their first year. Then there are a bunch of electives which come in pink and yellow and uh, they're offered in alternate years. So you need to plan if you want to take those because they're not offered every year. And then there are green ones that are offered every year like the seismology class, the introduction to inverse theory, introduction to computing, various things in here. And you would select, you would normally expect in your first year to take these orange ones and a collection of other ones according to your exact interests. So a little bit about the departmental exam. Uh, the departmental committee consists of three faculty um, and current, these are the current incumbents. They run a seminar in the first year on geophysics research skills. And their goal is to, in that seminar, is to teach you uh, how to do research or introduce you to the concept of how to do research. They serve as a first year guidance committee along with your primary advisor. And there's the same, the departmental committee ends up being the same for each student. And as I said, they'll encourage you to settle on an advisor you can get along with. And the exam has two parts, a take home written in June and an oral exam in September. And uh, the guidance committee is supposed to keep you connected to the information and prospective content about all of that. So, uh, Adrian already alluded to this. I've written it in slightly different words. We have a philosophy where we have a structured curriculum to provide foundational knowledge in geophysics. So if you haven't had that as an undergraduate, this is an opportunity to get connected to it. There's a broad range of both specialized and interdisciplinary courses as needed for your research interests. And I should say that the list that I gave you is only the geophysics list. There are actually many more courses across scripts that individuals might be interested in. Um, if you're doing an MS by thesis, know who you want to work with when you start, find an exciting research project, have fun doing it, and take advantage of the opportunities here. There's something for everybody. Um, applying to our program, I think uh, Ross is going to talk a little bit more about this, but these are the criteria, major in math, physics, earth sciences, or an equivalent qualification. Uh, GRE scores are not required for fall 22 admission. And it's really a good idea to reach out to a few faculty 
who you think you might like to work with and see if they're a good fit. You can always change your mind later on. Okay, uh, a, a thing that I want to emphasize here uh, for those of you who are writing applications is that these are the evaluation criteria we use um, and they're fairly standard, but I think it's important that you keep these in mind when you're writing your application. And the applications this year are due by December 1st. Now, I think I've still got a couple more things. Uh, talking about funding, once submitted, uh, PhD students are guaranteed five years of stipend and tuition support, provided they're in good academic standing. That means uh, they have to, to pass all their classes with a B or better. Um, and they have to do a satisfactory approach to their research. Some of the students will bring their own full or partial fellowship funding, and uh, that will, that will uh, pay for them. Uh, and if that runs out after three years, then their advisor will find them, fund, help them find more funding, or they will, the department will fund them, or they will TA. Many students are supported by their advisor's research grants as what we call graduate student researchers. Uh, and a point to note here, if you're thinking of applying to the MS program, MS students are not guaranteed funding, but there may be some opportunities as a teaching assistants or as GSRs, depending on their advisor's funding situation. So that's an important thing to think about if you're thinking of coming here as an MS student. Um, and uh, a point here, I don't know if there's anybody here who's still a junior, but if you want to learn more about scripts and geophysics research, we have a summer internship program. It's called the SURF program. So you can come and learn to surf and do research at the same time. And uh, lastly, I'll just finish here with our nice picture of the pier. And uh, sorry if I took a little longer than I should have just there. That's fine. Thank you, Kathy. Um, we will have a Q&A session later, so we will save questions for a later time. Um, next, we have a student representative, Zoe. Uh, she will give you an overview of the student life experience here. Yeah. Can you see my screen okay? Yes. Great. Um, yeah, so I'm Zoe. I'm a third year PhD student here at Scripps. And um, my goal is just to give you a sense of what it's like to be a student in the geophysics department here. So, um, so to, just to give you a sense of scope, because I think it's helpful um, when we're thinking about all of Scripps. By the way, these are my guesstimated numbers, so don't, so don't quote me on this, but um, we have about 70-ish um, PhDs that come into all of Scripps every year. So that's including marine biology, um, you know, physical oceanography, all these other disciplines. And then among those 70 students, they're usually around 10, varies a lot, um, new incoming students in the geophysics department. So that's kind of the incoming cohort. And those are the people that um, first years take classes with, share office space with. So those are really like the small um, nuclear family of people. Um, and then uh, we have about 45 total graduate students in the geophysics department. So um, I give these numbers mostly to show that it's a nice size where everyone knows each other. Like it's not so big that there are nameless faces or anything like that. Um, and this is the, um, the newest first year cohort here in the bottom, bottom left. Um, so I'll start with some of the more formal ways to be involved at Scripps, some of the more um, formal avenues, um, and then I'll kind of move to what day-to-day -day life is like and some of the more informal ways that um, people uh, know each other and spend time together at Scripps. So um, yeah, I'll first talk about these formal ways. So we've got the Graduate Student Association, which is the governing body for um, all graduate programs across UCSD. Um, we've got the Scripps Graduate Student Council, which is the graduate student um, governing body just for Scripps campus. And then there's a lot of opportunities to be involved in the operation of the geophysics department too. So um, graduate students are recruited for being on faculty hiring committees, for being part of the curriculum review. Um, we elect geophysics student representatives every year that help organize social events and um, are kind of stewards of the graduate student culture um, in the geophysics department. And then there's also a lot of opportunities kind of across scripts as well 
um, including but not limited to, um, we have a, a paid diversity, equity, inclusion fellows um, positions um, that do diversity, equity, inclusion work across scripts and are paid for that work. Um, we've got a bunch of SIO committees, um, so scripts committees that are kind of dealing with issues on campus ranging from safety to environmental impact. So there's a lot of um, kind of working groups there. And then um, there's also many student groups where you can kind of find people who share interests with you, whether they be academic or, or um, extracurricular. Um, so thinking about kind of what it's like to be a student within Scripps, um, like I said, your first year cohort is kind of your, your people, especially in your first year. It's people who you're taking pretty much every class with, um, you're doing homework with, and you spend um, your time with in the Keller, um, like Adrian said, as the first year offices. Um, here's some people hanging out in the Keller um, their first year. Um, the department also puts on some um, events that are really great. We've got Monday morning coffee where the department puts up um, really good coffee and pastries um, and everyone kind of starts their week off and, and chit chats and um, catches up. And um, then on Wednesday afternoons, the graduate students put out um, tea and snacks and everyone kind of takes a break and, um, you know, talk about research, talk about whatever, talk about the surf. And um, uh, the older graduate students also every year hold a mock oral exam for the first year students. So it's kind of just to help the first year students prep for their exam and make sure no one's too um, nervous about it or worried about it. Um, I'll say, you know, we have these formal events like the mock oral exam, but older graduate students are really available to first year students kind of year round. And so there's a really high exchange there between um, older graduate students and younger graduate students. Um, we also have movie nights where we show um, films that feature IGPP over the years. We do an annual camping trip that hopefully we'll get back to this year. Um, and then of course we have um, weekly technical seminars where we have geophysicists from around the world come and give talks and students are encouraged to go to lunch with them afterwards to have one-on-one -on -one meetings with them. And it's a great way to kind of both network and kind of get to know what's going on in the field, what's the, the latest and the greatest. Um, and then um, across SIO, across Scripps, we also have um, uh, a bunch of activities. So in your first quarter as a graduate student here, we have the first year seminar series um, where our academic coordinators kind of help us get um, uh, oriented with all the resources that are available to us on campus. Um, and help us kind of navigate um, transitioning to graduate school and make sure that we have a network set up of support. Um, we also have weekly seminars that are from, you know, departments or that are from kind of groups across campus. So there's always an interesting talk happening, whether it be in geophysics or in some other topic. Um, uh, we have a new uh, student run side chat seminar series where it's kind of a by students for students informal. Um, gathering where students can um, talk about the research or talk about another topic that they're interested in to other students as a way to kind of um, practice speaking and get feedback on your on your research. Um, and then every year we have a holiday party. So there's no shortage of, um, of uh, kind of fun and fulfilling things to do. Um, so living in San Diego, I'll start, I'll start with the not so great, which is that it's obviously really expensive to live in San Diego. Um, cost of living is pretty high here. Um, so depending on um, uh, you know how many roommates you want to have, what neighborhood you want to live in, I'd say you, you pay somewhere between broad range, 800 to 1200 a month. Um, so there is kind of, depending on what you'd like, there is a pretty broad range of possibilities. Um, the graduate student stipend for Scripps students is generally pretty generous. Um, I think right now it's 32 or 33,000 a year. So um, it's usually enough to make it work. And um, the other thing I'll say is graduate student housing is available. Um, it's now, they've just kind of changed the, the um, pricing structure. So now it's closer to market rate values, um, but that is kind of a way to um, get housing that's close to campus. And then um, for transportation, we have the trolley line that's opening in, um, like four days, which is very exciting. Um, and so hopefully that will do a better job of making like the, 
the more affordable kind of neighborhoods more accessible that you can kind of get to campus more easily. Um, and then we've also got a pretty good bus and shuttle system, particularly close to um, campus that people use really, really heavily. Um, there's pretty good biking infrastructure in San Diego if you'd like to bike commute to work. Um, and then you can always drive to it's, um, I'd say San Diego is kind of a driving city. Um, uh, parking is a little bit tough um, on Scripps campus, but you know, some people go that route too. Um, I'll talk also about uh, life at Scripps and life in San Diego. So, you know, we've got, like everyone said, we have an awesome ocean view that's really hard to get tired of. Um, endless surfing, beach walks, hiking, rock climbing, cycling. Um, people are kind of always up to something cool and interesting at Scripps. And there's a lot of really um, great people with different backgrounds, different interests um, that you can connect with and kind of form a community with. Um, in San Diego, obviously there's great weather year round. I see a lot of t-shirts in the, um, the little Zoom windows here. Um, there's good food and it's a, a safe and convenient place to live. Um, and I'll kind of end with this. So I think there is all these formal ways that we kind of provide support and um, community for, um, for graduate students in the geophysics department at Scripps. But the main thing I want to really communicate is that we have a really, really strong sense of community in the geophysics department, particularly I'd say among grad students. Like we really, we all know each other. We all like each other it's really not competitive, it's collaborative. The atmosphere is um, really supportive and people go out of their way to look out for each other and support each other. Um, you know, faculty, staff are really, really available to students if they ever need help. Um, doors are always open, maybe less so during COVID, but you know, metaphorically doors are always open. And um, yes, yeah, so I think um, that's really what makes it special to be a grad student here. Um, and uh, if there's anything I didn't cover, if there's anything that um, you'd like more clarification on, I'm happy to answer questions either now or um, I'll put my email in the, in the chat too. If you'd like to send me a message afterward, I'm happy to um, try and answer questions or connect you with someone who can um, uh, give you some answers. So, okay, thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Um, while following these three longer talks, we will have a sequence of uh, uh, disciplinary research pitch talks. And we will start with seismology and Alice, take the stage. Thank you, Wenyuan. So my name is Alice Gatnail, I'm incoming faculty. I'm not wearing a t-shirt, <laughs> it's a sweater because I'm dialing in from Germany and it's also already pitch black here at 6 p.m. Um, but I'm really happy to have three minutes to introduce you to the Proto Seismology um, group at ICPP. And uh, this first slide just um, has pictures and names and kind of subsections of seismology. And you will see it's very highly interdisciplinary, actually, what we are, what we are covering. Um, <clears throat> so we have Gabi Laske, marine geophysics, earth and planetary interior, uh, Peter Shearer, earth and planetary interior and earthquakes. Um, I'm here, I'm interested in computational and theoretical seismology and especially high performance computing. Um, Ross is here, um, marine geophysicist, also interested in earth and planetary interior. Um, Dave is a theoretical geophysicist. Of Peter Gerstoft is interested in machine learning, inverse methods. Jennifer Haas uh, kind of lives in two worlds, atmospheric science and also earthquake and tsunami science. Yuri, Fialco, geodesy and tectonics and earthquakes. And our host today, Benyuan, who is uh, um, also interested in earthquakes and environmental seismic sources and marine tube physics. And if you think that's a lot, we have more. Um, so here's a slide which is summarizing um, uh, retired uh, faculty and also um, research scientists. Um, we have Katrin de Croat Hedlin, uh, Michael Hedlin, Deborah Kilp, Guy Masters, Duncan Agnew, John Orcard, Frank Vernon, Pete Davis, and Mark Sumbersh. Sumbersh, who are here um, also available to support you in your research. And um, as you may see, there's a quite a a lot of faculty, and that is actually um, um, from what I, when I, what I experienced so far, really a good thing for being a credit student, because basically you will always have somebody to talk to and everybody's really happy to share the experience and their research interests and uh, um, their knowledge um, with the credit students that are, that are coming in. 
And um, you can contact ICPP seismologists to discuss potential projects and also please follow up with us. It's especially useful to contact us um, like after this virtual open house because you get a, a general introduction already and we could go um, into specifics if we're if we're chatting one on one. And here's just an overview of some of the um, kind of topics we're interested in. So here's um, a picture of an um, earthquake model, the Kakao earthquake using high performance computing. We have a um, US array kind of illustrating the large N or the large data sets. Um, to also get also with um, um, the geodetic network here in the Western US. Um, we have um, Cascadia cable arrays, kind of highlighting all these different data resources that we're using and um, um, the Cascadia initiative that is coming up, also broadly instrumenting subduction zones. And um, we could summarize that as large data sets, large computing and offshore observations. And then uh, here are a couple of example um, Project just from uh, the web page where they were listed uh, those faculties that are taking on students from the seismology track. And uh, I have here on the side again um, the view of the um, equinox or the monks lab, just from a different perspective. You don't only see excited people, but actually um, see this alignment. And um, we have, for example, Jennifer Haas, who is uh, welcoming um, students to imagine creative investigations of the tropical atmosphere with hurricanes, storm surge. North American monsoon, convection, and generate equatorial waves. We have <clears throat> um, Gabi Laske, observational seismology, research topic topics would cover aspects of structural seismology. We have um, Wen Yuan, who uh, welcomes students to work on earthquake seismology, environmental seismology, and marine geophysics. I get a bit shorter to stay in my three minutes here, and uh, but you can read that on the website. Then it's me, um, we welcome students next year in computation and theoretical seismology. And we have <clears throat> Yuri, who is a Fialco, who is interested in geodesy and tectonics. And current projects include studies of subsurface geometry of the Silence and Andreas fault, um, amongst other topics. And I have uh, Ross um, Parnell Turner listed here lastly as marine geophysics and possible projects with seagoing op opportunities to investigate oceanic crustal um, formation, faulting, and magmatism. And uh, why should you choose scripts? We already heard um, a lot of arguments, but here's some more. Um, I can really um, vouch for the large and very diverse number of faculty that is uh, engaged in a huge variety of projects, including um, all aspects of geophysics. The Keller was mentioned. Um, we have numerous opportunities to go on research cruises. We can take inverse theories and also other um, uh, courses that will prepare you for not only a career maybe in uh, geophysics academics, but also in geophysical industry. We have, uh, yeah, there's lots of recreational opportunities that I can't tell you much about because I'm not there yet, but uh, the weather looks perfect. Uh, students are treated as colleagues and are usually first authors on papers. It's a very important aspect as a proven track record in turning out good students uh, who've gone on and create careers. And IGPP operates um, I'm part of the Global Seismic Network, the ANSA Regional Seismic Network, there's a, a PFO, so the Pine and Flat Geophysics Observatory, and we have active seagoing programs. And uh, of course, you've seen that a lot. There's also the beach um, in all its beauty, but also in all its implications um, for the problems and opportunities of geophysical research of the, I don't know, the coming decades, including sea level rise, um, including climate change, and including um, better understanding of geophysical hazards and geohazards in general. And that's it from my side. Thank you, Elise. Um, after Elise, we have Kathy to give us an um, intro of the Earth and planetary interior and also geodynamics. Okay, uh, let me share my screen. That would be a good start. Okay, does everybody see a screen now? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to uh, talk just a little bit about um, Earth's interior and geodynamics. And um, we've already heard a bit about some of the folks who work on this um, in the sense of seismology. So I'm sort of focusing on what lies deep below the surface, who studies it and how. And when you talk about deep, buried, that the definition of deep of course will vary. Um, I'm thinking of things that are basically below the lithosphere. And I'm thinking about the idea of 
studying those things with seismology, with computational geodynamics, with electromagnetism and geomagnetism. And as Elise has already alluded to, one of the things that we have here is the idea that uh, theoretical, observational, and experimental approaches can all be used here. Uh, we have a first-hand experience um, in our major geophysical facilities. So there's the Ocean Bottom Seismograph Lab, the Electromagnetic Lab, the Iris Ida, part of the Global Seismic Network, the Pinion Flat Geophysics Observatory. And here's a cast of characters, many of whom you've seen already, Gabby Lasker and Peter Shearer, both of whom are doing uh, what we think of as structural seismology. So how the structure of the earth is built and what are the implications for that? Uh, computational dynamic, geodynamics, Dave May and Dave Stegman. Um, and over here, we have a, a group of three people who are interested in electromagnetism and geomagnetism and uh, the various uh, consequences of that. Whoops. So uh, let me, uh, for some reason, I think you've got into a funny mode here in Acrobat. Never mind. So um, we can use seismology to image the deep interior. Here are some of the things that uh, people are doing. These are some slides from Gabby Lasky's work uh, and also from normal modes. Uh, and the idea here is to look at uh, seismic variations in the mantle going all the way down into the core and use seismology to image the deep interior of the earth. On the right here, you see an example from geomagnetism where we're thinking about the geomagnetic field from the earth's core and mapping the surface magnetic field intensity from 85,000 years to the present. This is an exciting time because right down here, you'll see that the field is very weak and that's a signature of the Lechamp geomagnetic excursion, which um, we think of as being um, an aborted geomagnetic reversal. Um, if we are looking a little closer to the surface, here are some of the uh, couple of examples of the experimental things that people do. Uh, there's a, a picture of the swell experiment and looking using ocean bottom seismometers to look at the Hawaiian plume and study its structure. Here's a kind of a cross section of what we're looking at here and the surface instruments that's going on here. And uh, the idea then is to understand the large scale processes in the mantle leading to the, uh, the, the surface eruption of the plume. Uh, over on the right, there's another large scale feature that uh, is a subduction zone. Uh, this is a kind of iconic picture of what the electrical resistivity looks like as uh, one goes underneath, down the subduction zone beneath Nicaragua from work by Sama Naif, who was a graduate student here. Um, and uh, to link that, we have over here a result from uh, Adina Prusak and Dave Stegman uh, of geodynamic modeling, where they're looking at uh, uh, numerical experiments where they are looking at plume push and double subduction and trying to understand the physical processes that are associated with these large scale features that we find in the mantle. Okay, uh, I want to uh, just emphasize here that uh, in geophysics and the deep interior stuff, there's a lot of links to geosciences, uh, which is the other curricular group in the geo program, uh, particularly in the areas of high temperature geochemistry and the deep earth. Uh, James Day is interested in planet formation and the petrogenesis of igneous rocks. So that's a, a broader view of what's going on. And the deep earth uh, studies tend to be very interdisciplinary because everything is done by remote sensing. Uh, Pat Castillo is interested in the geochemistry and mid-ocean ridge basalts and ocean island basalts. Emily Chin, uh, the origin and evolution of continental crust. And my favorite subject, of course, is paleogeomagnetism. And Jeff Gee is uh, in the paleomagnetic club, uh, lab in the geosciences. So I'll just finish by saying that um, I would like to emphasize everything that Elise said about the idea that this is a good place to come because there's so much choice and there's such a, a breadth of approaches to addressing uh, geophysical problems, uh, especially within the deep earth. So thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Um, next, back to you, Adrian, to uh, introduce the geography group. Great. Um, so I realize I'm doing this totally differently than my, my colleagues. 
Um, the one caveat I have is that geodesy of the polar environment will be introduced by Helen Fricker shortly. So just a little bit of what we do, you'll see all of these pictures come back to you in a second. Um, uh, I've mentioned remote sensing before. And in fact, I think IGPP has been um, one of the pioneers in interferometric synthetic aperture radar. Uh, these are two earlier images, particularly the one on the left, <clears throat> Yuri Fialko's image of the BAM earthquake in, in Iran, where he showed shallow slip deficit, just an absolutely beautiful image. Um, Yuri and his group also have done work looking at, in this case, at magma uh, inflation in one of the stratovolcanoes in um, uh, the Altiplano in uh, South America. More recently, we are using INSAR, so this is on the right from Eric Shu, who works in Dave Sandball's lab, to now look at gradients in INSAR and see all these cracks that this was, well, this is related to the uh, 2019 Ridgecrest earthquake. And in fact, when the students, so this is all of you, we do a lot of this kind of field work. When the students went into the field, here's uh, Yao and Katya, we could actually find all the cracks that were in this image and, and vice versa. There was not a crack in the ground that we, we didn't actually see in the image as well, which was just super cool. Um, uh, you saw Jennifer Haas here, a picture of her in an airplane. She's using GPS, the geodetic technique, to sound uh, properties of the atmosphere. It's called uh, radar occultation. And part of her work involves uh, launching balloons from, uh, I think the Seychelles, and letting them go around uh, the earth. And uh, speaking of student opportunities, hey, look, there's my student, Nick Lau, who's currently in the Seychelles launching balloons. I, I think he's having a great time. Uh, back to um, our original uh, montage. On the right, this is uh, Yehuda Bach, um, a geodesist who's the director of the California Spatial Reference Center, does a lot of work on civil engineering applications. But Yehuda is also one of the pioneers of using GPS to measure offsets from earthquakes. And this is really important for earthquake early warning. And you see down here at the right, an example of that. We also use geodetic techniques to track water, both storage and flow of water. This is Wes Neely's, this comes from Wes Neely's uh, recent uh, dissertation. This is water flowing into and then through California's Central Valley. It's totally cool stuff. And then speaking of water, Hey, look, there's David Sandwell on a nine foot way right out in front of Scripps surfing. Um, he's, he still goes out there. And uh, David in his spare time is known to do things like use geodetic techniques to map uh, here the surface of Venus, or in fact, the surface of our own planet, most of which is hidden from us. And uh, apparently David also um, educates the US Navy on how not to ground its uh, submarines in the South China Sea. So um, anyway, with that, I will move along and turn it over to my colleague, Maddie. Yes, Maddie, um, now it's your time to introduce uh, theoretical geophysics. Am I unmuted? Yes. OK. Yes, so I will talk about theoretical and computational geophysics. And um, I say that it's, it's not boring. Uh, you know, Kathy and others have said that we have a pretty structured curriculum, which means that we do teach a lot of math that might be off-putting to some, but I want to make a point that is actually not boring and it's really important and really fun. Uh, so I put three pictures up that just like Adrian, I will bring back later and explain more. And just like everybody else, I also show you a nice picture of one of our seminar rooms or classrooms. And then uh, let me see. So usually we learn about Earth by measuring stuff, which is done here. Then we also think about what we measured and we theorize or model things in one way or another. And as models become more complicated, we compute a lot. So models are no longer models that you can um, solve with a pen and a paper. Usually you need a big computer. Alice loves big computers. There's many other people around us that like very big computers to numerically solve very complex models. And then um, this is typically pretty difficult because these models are of a high dimension and nonlinear. Nonlinear basically means that things you learn in school don't work anymore. You need new techniques and new exciting ideas to tackle these problems. And the high dimension is quite natural in um, geophysics, before, because Earth is, a, in some sense, a four-dimensional uh, object. There are three spatial dimensions in time. 
Now you want to put a you want to put that on a computer, which means you you discretize, you put down a grid, and then you can easily run into computations that um, that require that you compute with a million or hundreds of millions of of little numbers and parameters that specify your model. And examples are atmospheric models. Here's a cloud resolving uh, model. Here's a model of um, the fluid flow of Earth, a liquid core that then generates and sustains a magnetic field. It's also quite complicated. And there, here's an, uh, an inversion of ele an electromagnetic data set. Um, and then there's inverse modeling, which was highlighted by Alice as one of the, of the key things that you learn here. And that is part of the fun that you have when you go through the IGPP curriculum. So inverse modeling is the following. You have a model. In my cartoon, this would be this brown line here. It, it predicts the evolution of a, of a state of an Earth's process, for example, as a function of time. And then, unfortunately, people go out and measure things. And often, your initial model does not quite align with the observation that you have. And then in a process called inverse model, you can try to adjust your model in one way or another to make those two things more compatible. So now you have an adjusted model that's represented by this blue line here that now beautifully passes by all the observations that you have. And then with some luck, the actual thing you're describing is also within the, the range of, of possibilities that you have computed. So inverse modeling brings it all together. You have these difficult models, um, you have, data, you have a big computer, and you put it all together to get a, a nice inverse solution. So in summary, I would say that uh, computational and theoretical geophysics is quite difficult, hence we need your help. Um, and there's lots of opportunities here and elsewhere to create new mathematics and compu computational tools to, to solve these problems. And it's not boring, because usually it's an interdisciplinary uh, exercise where you talk with people who go to see, or you might go to the UC yourself, and you have to talk with a lot of people to make, um, make all of this work. You can also learn a lot about data science and machine learning in the process. And in order to help set you up for success, we provide a lot of classes. And, um, and examples of these classes are the core classes of geophysical data analysis A and B, the inverse theory. There might be a part two of inverse theory. There's a course uh, soon about practical PDE and many others. You saw the long list of classes, many of which are foundational to setting the, the basic knowledge of, of how to compute and how to do um, uh, mathematical and computational modeling. And then here are a few faces. All of, I think you've seen all of them now, but this is a subset of people who are really interested in computing. I mean, almost everybody uses it, but these are, I think, a subset of the people who spend a lot of time thinking about it. There's Dave, Alice, uh, another Dave, Stegman, uh, Peter Gerstoff, who does machine learning, uh, and Steve and Kathy and myself. And you could reach out, I would say, I would volunteer their time, you can reach out to them. But you can also always reach out to me if you have more questions on this particular part of our, our program. My email is written here. I also put it in the chat, and that's um, and that's what I have prepared. Thank you, Maddie. Um, okay. Talking about Stop. going to see, uh, we have Ross Parnell Turner to introduce Marine Geophysics program. Uh, hi, can you can you all see my my slides? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so, hi, I'm I'm Ross Parnell Turner. I'm an assistant professor here at IGPP. Um, and not surprisingly, given that we're here at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, there's quite a lot of marine geophysics that goes on um, in this building and elsewhere at Scripps. Um, and I'm just going to give you a little whistle stop tour of those of us here who do research at sea. And then we're just going to have a quick look at some tasters of some of the research that individual um, groups are up to. So um, to introduce you to the marine geophysicists that are here, um, these include people like Steve Constable, who works on electromagnetism, and I'll show you a bit more about what he does in a moment. Um, and then there's a group of us, uh, Wenyuan, uh, Fan, myself, and Gabby Lasky, who, who work on mostly things like marine seismology um, and, uh, and things like earthquake triggering, mantle plumes, and seismic noise. We have Mark Zumberg, who works on things like marine geodesy, and I'll show you a bit more about that um, in a few moments time. And then uh, rather like the seismologists, we have to go on to a second slide because there's quite a few of us. Um, and there are people uh, like Matt Jishu, who works on uh, ocean acoustics. I won't go through this entire list. Um, uh, and people like uh, Jeff Gee, who work on paleomagnetism. 
and Len Strunka, for example, who's a, a faculty member here who um, has a history from, uh, from industry. So the thing that we all have in common, and I think you've seen uh, these vessels before, is that we all have an interest in, in doing our science um, in the oceans. Um, and we're very fortunate here at Scripps that we, uh, we have a, a fleet of research vessels that is operated by the institution. Um, and so we have a very close relationship with both um, these vessels and also the instruments that, that we use and we, we put on them. Um, and I'll show you a bit more about that in a second. So these ships, um, they are nominally, uh, their home port is here in San Diego, but they go all over the globe. In particular, uh, this one, the Ravel and the Sally Ride are what are called uh, global or ocean class, which means they can go anywhere in the world. And at any one, any one time, they could be um, pretty much um, anywhere. Whereas this vessel, the Sproul, and also this uh, more recently recent addition to the fleet, the Robin, the Bob and Betty Beister is more of a local, a local vessel that we can do our experiments on. So I'm just going to give you a quick uh, flavor of some individual people's research. Uh, this, these are this some results from Steve Constable's group, which use uh, these uh, instruments uh, to collect uh, controlled source electromagnetic data in places like the California borderlands. These are some results off the coast of California here um, that were produced by one of his, uh, his students. We have Wen Yuan Fan, uh, who uh, is our host today and has been doing some really fascinating work on using uh, seismology techniques to uh, observe uh, submarine landslides in the Gulf of Mexico. And then myself, uh, I'm particularly interested in the processes going on on mid-ocean ridges. So uh, this is a photograph inside uh, the control van for the submersible uh, Jason, which we use to explore this portion of the East Pacific rise, which uh, we hope is about to erupt um, in the next couple of years. And then lastly, uh, just to give you a flavor of uh, what Mark Zumberg does, uh, he runs a seafloor geodesy um, a group who use uh, equipment like uh, these um, surface uh, sea surface gliders combined with satellites and combined with transponders and ocean bottom seismographs that we put on the seafloor to observe processes like the, uh, the subduction of uh, the oceanic lithosphere in places like uh, the Northwest um, Pacific margin. That's all I wanted to say. If you have any more questions, feel free to drop me an email individually or any of the people that you saw um, on the list. Thank you, Ross. Um, last pitch talk will be given by Helen Fricker. Uh, she will tell us about our polar science uh, research program. Thanks, Wenyan. Okay, let's just share this. I haven't, I forgot my glasses, so bear with me. <laughs> Literally can't see what I'm doing. Um, okay. Okay. Did I get it working? Oops. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Perfect. Can you see a, a tent on an ice sheet? <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry, everyone. Uh, hi, I'm Helen Fricker. Um, I'm in IGBP. I'm also a co director of the fairly new scripts. Uh, Polar Center. Um, the Polar Center does a lot, and I'm just going to talk to you about one very small aspect of it, um, which overlaps the most, I guess, with um, IGPP interest, but there's many other things that you can get into as well. So um, this is actually a photograph taken on an ice stream um, by my former student, Matt Siegfried, and postdoc um, Oliver Marsh when they were doing a uh, radio echo sounding uh, survey to see how thick the ice is there over a lake. Um, so, yeah, as we know, I mean, I'm just going to very um, just touch on why we do what we do. I mean, the big picture thing for uh, studying ice sheets is because um, ice sheets are losing mass to the ocean. We know from multiple different um, satellite instruments um, that we're losing mass around the edges um, of both ice sheets, Greenland and Antarctica. This is a grace time series. Um, and basically what we look at it it's it's a it's a big system so this is actually a cross section through the whole um, ice sheet starting off over on the left the grounded ice underneath we have um, 
so glacial water, this is a very uh, interesting part of the system and IGPP researchers have been involved in um, sort of uh, probing this, this water and getting properties um, and seeing how thick it is. Lots of very active research going on on this side, but I'm going to uh, just focus quickly uh, on the bit where um, the ice meets the ocean, because this is where the interdisciplinary work comes in and turns out that it's actually the ocean attacking the ice around the edges that's causing the mass loss, which is one of the reasons why we sort of uh, decided to start this polar center, because it really is an interdisciplinary topic. Um, so basically we have ice coming in, ice going out through different ways, but most of these ways are actually where it meets the ocean. So iceberg carving, basal melting. How do we get at these processes? It's really difficult to, to get at them. Um, but here at Scripps, it's actually great. It's, it's, um, we've got access to world-class researchers on both sides of the grounding line, you know, on the, uh, solid, the solid earth side and also over in the ocean. And you need both because we're seeing in our community around the world that we actually need this interdisciplinary research to understand this system. So I think we've actually made uh, quite a lot of progress doing that. And some of the students um, who've, who've benefited from this, you'll see them throughout this talk. This is very, very uh, quick talk, but Fernando was able to look at ice shelves and determine using 20 years of um, remote sensing data, this is altimetry, that the ice shelves are thinning and that's accelerating. And that's because it's happening around the edges, but there's also some atmospheric processes going on as well. So this involves collaborating um, across the bridge, which we often uh, tend not to do, but this has been really, uh, really fantastic. Um, basically, this is very important for understanding how the ice is flowing into the ocean because the ice shelves and how they're changing, this is affecting how much um, restraint they're putting on the grounded ice upstream on the grounding line. And we've teamed up with ice sheet modelers around the world to understand that. Um, this is an ice sheet modeler um, over in uh, in the UK that we teamed up with and basically where the ice shelves are thinning that is where the more ice is coming um, across the granny line and causing sea level to rise. Um, we've also now got a new instrument ice sat two um, and we are able to now look across the whole ice sheet and see where the ice shelves are thinning and where the grounded ice is responding upstream um, and lo and behold it's changing where the ocean is coming close um, so this is We've known this for a long time now, but the heat in the ocean from um, climate change is actually now affecting slowly around the edges and eroding um, the ice sheets. And this is getting stronger. Um, and so this is actually work that um, many of my students have been involved in. Uh, this is Sashil Adesamili, who's still here. He's now a postdoc. Um, and he actually was able to also determine using ISAT to the atmospheric rivers, which you might have heard about um, on the west coast of the US, is bringing mass to the ice sheet as well. So this is kind of these processes are, are overlapping on different timescales and sort of competing for whether the ice is being added or taken away. And the net sum of that, just like your bank account, is whether you're going to lose mass or, um, or increase. And that is affecting sea level rise. Uh, so Sheila was also able to look at basal melt rates all around Antarctica over 20 years, which is really important for uh, ice sheet um, predictions and putting into models. Um, so I'll wrap up. Um, show this is a photograph of Maya uh, Becker. She's one of my um, other students who um, is um, was able to go down and put um, floats into the ocean off Ross Ice Shelf to try and get um, information about the water around the edges. Um, I'm going to just jump over all this because I really don't think I have time, but the point here is that ice sheets are losing uh, mass and it's becoming more um, and more so as time goes on because we, we're actually um, seeing this more effect of the warming oceans. And so this is going to become a very interesting research topic, uh, definitely here at IGPP over the next five to 10 years or so. So um, this is very important for uh, IPCC reports and things. I mean, the missing link in what we need to know about the ice sheets and how they're changing is the processes. And that's where I think research at IGPP can help to understand those processes uh, with the instruments that we're now launching to be able to do that. So um, yeah, Polar Center is very exciting. We're currently housed here in Maison, which is up the hill a bit from IGPP. Um, and this is quite new and it's really just been in the last sort of uh, six years or so that we've managed to get this. So it's an exciting time to come to Scripps and do polar science. Um, you can look at the website here for how to do it. It's not um, completely straightforward, but we can help you through that. So um, yeah, these are the overlapping uh, sort of curricular groups in the Polar Center and you'll see many people um, on this call today who are 
uh, identify as polar uh, and definitely not everybody has um, has there's definitely more people who could be added to this so I will um, leave you with the link in the chat and you can go and have a look for yourself and look forward to talking to you more. Great thank you Helen um, I know there are, it's a lot of information and I hope we didn't overwhelm you but if we did don't worry we have recorded all the materials and we will share the slides later. Um, now for the la last part, um, Ross and me, we will talk a little bit about the application uh, to the uh, great to the uh, to physics program. Do you want me to talk talk through this little slide, Wenyuan? Sure, go ahead. Um, so as you guys have seen before, um, the application deadline is December the 1st. And also, as you saw before, um, this year, uh, like last year, we will not be requiring anybody to submit GRE scores. Um, we wanted to emphasize that we do read those personal statements that you write. So um, it's important that you take some time to think about those personal statements. And in those statements, um, you might want to think about these factors that we use to evaluate um, the, whole, um, the whole of your application, um, which are listed up there. Um, and so those include things like your ac academic preparation, your scholarly potential, contributions to diversity, equity, and inclusion issues, um, your alignment to the program. Um, and by that, I mean um, how well your interests match up with um, the interest that your potential advisor might have. And then some um, other uh, aspects like your ability to um, have a realistic view of your own um, progress and your long-term long goals um, for your career. You'll also find when you fill out the application form, there are these um, what we call experiential questions, which I've listed on the right-hand side. Those are not compulsory to, to, to fill out, but um, I encourage you to, to have a think about those questions um, and, and answer them. The more you can tell us about you, then the more we get to know you and uh, the better your chances um, of admission. This is my, my last slide, I think, Wenyuan. Um, so I just wanted to uh, uh, share with you the, the kind of the process steps that we go through, um, which are listed up here. Um, so um, we're just about coming up to the deadline and after the deadline, um, the applications are reviewed by faculty across the geophysics curricular group. Um, and if you're spanning more than one curricular group, then maybe faculty outside of the geophysics group. Some of you will be invited for Zoom interviews in January. And then towards the end of January, um, we'll start sending offers, although typically they don't happen all at once. So if you don't hear from us with an offer by the end of January, don't lose all hope. There is an open house, which is hosted by um, the Scripps department, which happens in mid-February. And after that point, um, you'll have a chance to um, think about whether you want to um, accept our offer or not. If you haven't had an offer at that point, you may end up on a, what we call a holding list. Um, and feel free to contact us if we haven't contacted you um, to find out whether you're on that holding list or not. And that'll and hopefully enable you to make decisions about other places you might have applied to. And then the whole process hopefully wraps up by tax day. Um, and that's uh, the deadline that we, um, we hope that everyone can agree to um, give their responses about whether they're gonna accept or decline um, our offer of admission. Uh, we've talked about funding, but I just wanted to reiterate that the um, support that we offer um, is for 12 months. It's a stipend, which is around $33,000, and that includes tuition and health insurance. Um, and in the interest of time, if you have any further questions um, specific to your application, then please feel free to email uh, Wenyuan or myself uh, using this uh, email address, which is right here. And also, I want to mention, if you have general application questions, you can um, contact Gilbert and Dina, who are also online here, uh, to address the whole process, uh, questions related to the whole uh, application process.